This is the second lecture for Monday, April 27th. Very last lecture, very last day of class. And for this lecture, I want to talk about overexploitation to begin with. And then we'll continue on looking at, at uh, other aspects of this idea of biodiversity and extinction. So we're right now, we're looking at extinction as something that's leading to a reduction in biodiversity. Things are going extinct, they're gone forever. And so we looked at these different different factors that are really important, especially habitat destruction and modification or fragmentation these days. Well, overexploitation historically was something that was a, a big problem for species going extinct. And you might think, well, we didn't have the same technological capabilities back then that we have now. People were going out hunting and fishing and, and sometimes primitive ways. But there's things that go extinct. And historically, a lot of things that went extinct because of overexploitation. It's quite a bit different now than it was. But still, there's a lot of different species that are no longer found on the face of the earth because they were overexploited. Sometimes you know, we would hunt something or fish something down to a certain level. We didn't catch the very last one. We didn't kill the very last one. But the population size got to be so small that it was that, that below that minimal viable population, minimum viable population that we looked at when you're looking at population ecology. A lot of this had to do with islands. We'll look at that to a certain degree. But, uh, you know, in the old days, look, you'd fish from this boat. How are you going to drive something to extinction that way? Well, you weren't really. These days, you've got these very sophisticated boats and navigation that people are really, really good at finding fish out in the ocean. So from the 1950s on, it's been this huge increase in fish that were taken out of the ocean and actually it reached a peak within the last 20 years. We're not catching as many fish as we used to. And a very large proportion of fish populations around the world, in the ocean anyway, are overexploited. They're being fished at a greater rate than they're reproducing. If you think about on land, you know, we used to hunt with spears and arrows in primitive ways. Now, look, you can get this, this uh, rifles and crossbows and uh, this sportsmanship where you go out and hunt for things. Uh, it's not always that sporting because the animals don't have much of a chance sometimes. And if you look at this historically, humans were moving around. They would show up at a new habitat, on a new island, in a new area. And so humans were like these exotic species, these invasive species. And the animals there, or the plants, had never experienced anything like humans. They didn't know what to do. They, and so humans could impact their populations very quickly. Even these hunter-gatherer types, if there were, there were these species that didn't have any natural predators, anything like humans, we were pretty good. Even as primitive as we are, we were pretty good at eliminating them, at, at hunting them until there were no more, at harvesting them until there were no more. So a, a lot of different species gone extinct at the hands of humans. On islands like Hawaii, for, for example, people have this impression that Westerners showed up in Hawaii and the introduction of exotic species, habitat destruction, those kind of things, are what has led to so many extinct and endangered and threatened species in Hawaii. It's, it's really, of the, all the different endangered species in the United States, there's a very disproportionately large amount in Hawaii, especially considering the tiny little bit of land area that it is. But even thousands of years ago, when Polynesians showed up on the islands of Hawaii, there were these birds that were flightless. There were a lot of flightless birds. There were birds that lived close to shore, close to the coastline. 
humans, these Polynesians that were there for a few thousand years before Westerners showed up, they led those going extinct. They caught those, they killed them. Same thing with the other islands like Madagascar. Humans showed up there about 1,500 years ago, these flightless birds. We'll look at one specific example in that area. And uh, if they can't fly, if they don't have any natural defenses, we're not very good hunters, let's face it, as humans. But we're still pretty good at making things go extinct. Here's an example in the ocean. Cellar sea cow. This big, it was like a manatee, basically. They're extinct now. They used to be up north in the Bering Sea. They were slow-moving and big herds. They didn't know what to think when humans showed up. They'd never seen anything like it. They didn't have any defenses. And so, and they're, they're like manatee, very easy to, exploit, to uh, over-exploit. And then 1741 is when we found these. And uh, look, 27 years later, they're gone. That's pretty amazing when you think about it. Well, let's look at some of the things that have taken place on islands. Now, I mentioned Hawaii, Madagascar, and this uh, other island, Guam. So you've had some introduction to this. But there were a lot of examples. If you look at Hawaii and, and some of these other places where people started showing up there, and they would encounter these birds, mammals, even seals, things in the ocean, where they had evolved over thousands of years, millions of years, with no predators, anything like humans. And we came along and did a very good job, actually, as primitive as we were, making things go extinct or leading to extinctions of a lot of different organisms, especially birds. Birds were heavily hit. There were a lot of flightless birds. There's, it's a common evolutionary history on islands where you have these isolated populations for birds to be flightless. You don't need to fly because it's a waste of energy. You, there's nothing to fly away from because you don't have any big land predators. Well, humans showed up, and as I said, we're not the best predators, but even we could catch these flightless birds and drive them to extinction. Now, here's an example. Maybe thought thought to be the, the first extinction recorded by humans, at least in the, the Western and, and documented, is the dodo bird. There's a dodo bird. And so they were big birds, good source of food, but they're pretty clumsy, flightless. Look at those tiny little wings that this bird has. And uh, clumsy, like I said, so... If somebody calls you a dodo, you know it's not a complimentary thing. And so the uh, just before 1600, Portuguese sailors showed up on Mauritius in the Indian Ocean where these dodo birds were, right off Madagascar. And so they, they needed things to eat. They hunted them. There were dogs that were introduced, rats and pigs that were introduced a, a few years later. And they, would, they could kill the dodo. They could eat their eggs. They could eat their young. And within 80 years, this is in 1600, imagine how, how primitive we were in terms of, of the technology that we have to hunt things. But in 80 years, dodo is extinct. And then all you hear about it is a dodo or somebody calling you a dodo. And they're, they're gone forever. Well, let's ask this question. The, the last part is... How many species are threatened? Maybe a more proper word or way to look at this would be how many species are endangered? And there's this fine line between threatened and endangered. But threatened, if, you're, if you go a little farther than threatened, then you become endangered. And these are species that are in danger, whether they're endangered or whether they're just threatened. But their populations are imperiled. There's a good chance that if things go this way instead of that way, these species could go extinct. And so there's different agencies within gov governments, within the United States, for instance, 
there's a in, within a Department of Commerce, there's the National Marine Fisheries Service, which can put things on the endangered species list, and they're responsible for things that are in the water. There's the Wildlife Service. The Federal Wildlife Service is part of the Department of Interior that has a, a big role in placing things on the endangered species list for things above the waterline, things on land. So there's these two agencies in the United States. There's international agencies. One of the big ones is the, the ICUN, the IUCN, International Union for the Conservation of Nature. In fact, that's wrong, so we should change that. This is an international agency, conservation group, that puts out red lists and it classifies all these different species as endangered or critically endangered or threatened or, or the insufficient data. But they have this red list that people pay a lot of attention to. And if you look at the, the, the listing of these different species on the, the red list of the IUCN, then about 31% of amphibians, 20% of mammals, and down the list you can see the number of species. Now this was some time ago, and some of these have gotten worse for the most part. And the way that the environmental movement is going, especially in the United States, all these things have been rolled back. It's good for business, not so good for habitat destruction. There's nothing's being listed on the Endangered Species Act. Landowners have free reign to do all kinds of things. And uh, it's a very different atmosphere these days. So these numbers have only gotten worse, at least in the United States and some other places. So worldwide, you saw those kind of proportions of amphibians and mammals and birds that are either threatened or endangered. They're on the IUCN red list. Just in the United States, 1973, Richard Nixon was president, Republican, came up with this. The, the U.S. Congress passed the Endangered Species Act. So an endangered species is one that's threatened with extinction. A threatened species <coughs> is likely to become endangered. Threatened species are things that we want to look at ahead of time and get in, going down the track of where they go the opposite direction of moving towards being placed on the endangered species list. But instead, they recover and never make their way to the endangered species list. So if something is listed as endangered, then there's all kinds of things that go into effect. There's some agency some task force is in charge of monitoring that population. There's a lot of money that goes towards recovering that population. So as you might imagine, the number of species that is added to the endangered species list varies with the administration. We've got this administration now. We're not particularly interested in adding things to the endangered species list. In fact, it's better to get them off the endangered species list and there's uh, different numbers, different rates of species being added to this. And uh, there's also states that have their own endangered species list. So some species might be endangered in Massachusetts or Rhode Island or Maine, someplace. And also on the U.S. endangered species list, but they're not always the same. Each state has its own list of endangered species. If you look in New England, not according to Rhode Island or Massachusetts, but if you look at the endangered species that occur in Rhode Island, these U.S. endangered species, there's a bunch of invertebrates, there's fish, reptiles, birds, mammals, there's a bunch of plants. So here's some that you find in the ocean. There's the mussel and uh, sturgeon, some marine turtles, sea turtles, not that many species out in the ocean. There's a number of birds. Piping plovers have big influence on people that have houses by the, by the beach because you have to 
watch out for their nests and show people sometimes to see the, a nest that's destroyed because they don't want it on their beach. They want to go out and sit on their beach with their chairs. There's some other things in the, the ocean, whales, a number of different species of whales. The right whale in particular is not very many of those. And then there's a number of different plants as well. These are all in New England, in fact, in southern New England. So compared to other parts of the country, the list isn't so extensive of endangered or threatened species in New England. It's a relatively small area, but you go to some other places, there are a lot of endangered species within a much smaller area. All right, so that pretty much concludes the coverage of all these different courses. I just want to take a minute to remind you of the learning outcomes that were intended for this course. Now, obviously, we had to do things very differently. No one anticipated this. No one has ever experienced anything like this. So you guys have done your best to different degrees. We've done our best as a class, as a, a university, to adapt to these new set of conditions and I think for this class, the learning objectives and the coverage of the material, we've still managed to go through these different topics. I've given all the lectures that I would have given in, if we would have met in per person, even more, probably. But we've been able to address all these different things and meet these learning objectives. What's really different is how we assess your learning. You know, we can't give exams in person and the exams that you give online, there's different expectations of, of honesty and what kind of resources you're using. You're not being monitored. And so people have had to adapt that way. But we've, we've done a accomplished, you could check off each one of these learning outcomes because we've gone through each one of those including this very last one, how humans have affected other living things, which is part of ecology is interactions. This last thing has been focused on human interactions with other living things. And then one last thing to remark on is our final exam. Our final exam for this class is Friday, May 1st. That's this Friday from 11 to 8 a.m. Now, if we were meeting in person, that's when you'd show up. You'd have this three hours to take the exam. We'd have a 100-point multiple-choice exam, 100-question multiple-choice exam. We can't do that. So what we're going to do instead is this hybrid final exam that's going to be posted. It's going to be available for you starting 8 o'clock in the morning on Friday. You'll have until... 11.55 at night to finish the multiple choice part of that exam. That's going to be 40 questions. So it's like a quiz on Sakai, except there's 40 questions instead of 10, like our quizzes. So you go on Sakai, this quiz, well, this exam the multiple choice portion of this exam will be timed and you'll have a certain amount of time, 40 minutes, to answer this 40 question multiple choice exam. I, No one's going to see what you're doing when you're taking this exam, so people are going to be looking things up to answer the questions. The expectation is that you do very well on this multiple choice part of the exam. It, of course, it'll help you answer questions, spend less time looking up the answers, and get more questions right if you study ahead of time. But the idea is that you'll be able to do well, look at these questions, and come up with the correct answer for most of them. That's one section of the final exam, this multiple choice section. The other thing that we're going to do is have one essay question. You'll have your, your choice of several essay questions, but you'll answer one that will, they'll all be posted 
on May 1st. You can look through the different choices, choose one, answer that question, and submit your answer to Dropbox. And that will be due by May 4th. You'll have three days to do this. In fact, I need to change this. I might as well do this right now if you guys are, you know, there's about half of you that listen to these essay questions, essay, or these uh, video exams, video lectures. That's what they are. So the essay question, that's what this says. Good thing I looked at this. There'll be an announcement as well as talking about this. The essay portion of this, this is this one question that you answer, that you choose from and you answer, and you submit this in Dropbox. That is due four days later. You get it on Friday. You can work on it on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. It's due Monday night. Monday, May Fourth. So, well, it's modified during this uh, video lecture. You would have gotten this in the announcement. You will get this in the announcement. So that's what the final exam is going to be like, this hybrid final exam. Part multiple choice that you have to finish on May 1st, and then this one essay question that you have to finish by May 4th. So I hope you enjoyed the class, even with this, these challenging times. I hope you learned a lot, and uh, it would have been nice to meet in person and see you guys every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but we have to make do with the situation as it is.